Hello everyone, Mr. Price here with our new Read Aloud for today. I wanted to get to this book last month, but our pacing was a little off and we ran out of time. But the book that we're going to be starting today is called The Watsons Go to Birmingham by Christopher Paul Curtis. And I wanted to start this last month because it is about a black family that's living in Flint, Michigan, and I thought it would be a good thing to read during Black History Month. But like I said, our scheduling was a little off with the late start of the year, and so we kind of fell behind. So we're getting to it now and honoring Black History, even though it's not Black History Month anymore. So like I said, the book we're taking a look at is uh, The Watsons Go to Birmingham, 1963. It's written by Christopher Paul Curtis. And what is really awesome about it is he's the same author of Bud Not Buddy, if you've read that. But the book takes place in Flint, Michigan, for uh, a large portion of it. And Christopher Paul Curtis himself is from Flint. So you know, we've got that local connection with this story today. Now, the chapters in this book are a bit longer than those that we had in um, because of Mr. Terrupt. So during some section of this, I may only end up reading a portion of a chapter rather than a whole. I'll let you guys know as we progress through the story. Today, we're starting with chapter one, and you wonder why we get called the Weird Watson. It was one of those super duper cold Saturdays. One of those days that when you breathed out, your breath kind of hung frozen in the air like a hunk of smoke. You could walk along and look exactly like a train blowing out big, fat, white puffs of smoke. It was so cold that if you were stupid enough to go outside, your eyes would automatically blink a thousand times all by themselves, probably so the juice inside of them wouldn't freeze up. It was so cold that if you spit, the slob would be an ice cube before it hit the ground. It was about a zillion degrees below zero. It was even cold inside our house. We put sweaters and hats and scarves and three pairs of socks on and still were cold. The thermostat was turned all the way up and the furnace was banging and sounding like it was just about to blow up, but it still felt like Jack Frost had moved in with us. All of my family sat real close together on the couch under a blanket. Dad said this would generate a little heat, but he didn't have to tell us this. It seemed like the cold automatically made us want to get together and huddle up. My little sister, Joetta, sat in the middle, and all you could see were her eyes because she had a scarf wrapped around her head. I was next to her, and on the outside was my mother. Mom was the only one who wasn't born in Flint, so the cold was coldest to her. All you could see were her eyes, too and they were shooting bad looks at Dad. She always blamed him for bringing her all the way from Alabama to Michigan, a state she called a giant icebox. Dad was bundled up on the other side of Joey, trying to look at anything but Mama. Next to Dad, sitting with a little space between them, was my older brother, Byron. Byron had just turned 13, so he was officially a teenage juvenile delinquent and didn't think it was cool to touch anybody or let anyone touch him, even if it meant he froze to death. Byron had tucked the blanket between him and Dad down into the cushion of the couch to make sure he couldn't be touched. Dad turned on the TV to try to make us forget how cold we were, but all that did was get him in trouble. There was a special news report on Channel 12 telling about how bad the weather was, and Dad groaned when the guy said, if you think it's cold now, wait until tonight. The temperature is expected to drop into record low territory, possibly reaching the negative 20s. In fact, we won't be seeing anything above zero for the next four to five days. He was smiling when he said this, but none of the Watson family thought it was funny. We looked over at Dad. He just shook his head and pulled the blanket over his eyes. Then the guy on TV said, Here's a little something we can use to brighten our spirits and give us some hope for the future. The temperature in Atlanta, Georgia is forecast to reach. Dad coughed real loud and jumped off the couch to turn the TV off, but we all heard the weatherman say, The mid-70s. The guy might as well tied Dad to a tree and said, Ready? Aim? Fire. 
Atlanta, Mama said. That's 150 miles from home. Bologna, Dad said. I knew it, Mama said. I knew I should have listened to Moses Henderson. Who? I asked. Dad said, oh, Lord, not that sorry story. You got to tell. You gotta let me tell about what happened with him. Mama said, There's not a whole lot to tell. Just a story about a young girl who made a bad choice. But if you do tell it, make sure you get all the facts right. We all huddled as close as we could get because we knew Dad was going to try to make us forget about being cold by cutting up. Me and Joey started smiling right away, and Byron tried to look cool and bored. Kids, Dad said, I almost wasn't your father. You guys came real close to having a clown for a daddy named Ham Bone Henderson. Daniel Watson, you stop right there. You're the one who started that Ham Bone nonsense. Before you started that, everyone called him his Christian's Christian name, Moses. And he was a respectable boy, too. He wasn't a clown at all. But the name stuck, didn't it? Ham Bone Henderson. Me and your granddaddy called him that because the boy had a head shaped just like a ham bone. Had more knots and bumps on his head than a dinosaur. So as you guys sit here giving me these dirty looks because it's a little chilly outside, ask yourselves if you'd rather be a little cool or go through life being known as the ham bonettes. Me and Joey cracked up. Byron kind of chuckled and Mama put her hand over her mouth. She did this whenever she was going to give a smile because she had a great big gap uh, between her front teeth. If Mama thought something was funny, first you'd see her trying to keep her lips together to hide the gap. Then, if the smile got to be too strong, you'd see the gap for a hot second before Mama's hand would come up to cover it. Then she'd crack up too. Laughing only encouraged Dad to cut up more. So when he saw the whole family thinking he was funny, he really started putting on a show. He looked in, in front of the TV. Yep, ham bo or, excuse me, he stood in front of the TV. Yep. Ham Bone Henderson proposed to your mother around the same time I did. Fought dirty, too. Told your mama a pack of lies about me, and when she didn't believe them, he told her a pack of lies about Flint. Dad started talking Southern style, imitating this Ham Bone guy. Walona, I heard that... I, I heard tell about the weather up that far in... Far north in Flint, Michigan. Heard it's colder than inside an ice box. Seen a movie about it. I think it was made in Flint, a movie called Nanook of the North. Yep, do believe for sure it was made in Flint. Uh-huh, Flint, Michigan. Uh, folks there live in these things called igloos. <clears throat> Don't believe I've seen one colored person in the whole dang city. And they use that term in the book. I, I apologize if, if you found that offensive. Uh... You a Bama gal. Don't believe you'd be too happy living in no igloo. Aside from that, I heard all they eat is whale meat. Don't believe you'd like no whale meat. Don't taste like chicken. <clears throat> Don't taste lick like pork at all. Mama pulled her hand away from her mouth. Daniel Watson, you are one lying man. Only thing you said that was true was that being in Flint is like living in an igloo. I knew I should have listened to Moses. Maybe these babies might have been born with lumpy heads, but at least they'd have had warm lumpy heads. You know Birmingham's a good place, and I don't mean just the weather either. Life is slower, people are friendlier. Oh yeah, Dad interrupted. They're a laugh a minute down there. Let's see, where's the coloreds only bathroom downtown? Again, remember guys, this is the 1960s that this book is taking place, and, and I read that word for effect setting the scene for the world that these characters lived in at that time. Daniel, you know what I mean. Things aren't perfect, but people are more honest about the way they feel. She took her mean eyes off Dad and put them on Byron, and folks there do know how to respect their parents. Byron rolled his eyes like he didn't care. All he did was tuck the blanket further into the couch's cushion. Dad didn't like the direction the conversation was going, so he called the landlord for the hundredth time. The phone was still busy. That snake in the grass has got his phone off the hook. Well, it's going to be too cold to stay here tonight. Let me call Sydney. Back in those times, they didn't have cell phones or things like that, so your phone had this little, like, either little buttons or, like, a little hook on it, and you would 
rest your phone on it, and if that button was pressed down, you could receive calls. But if you took that phone off of that, the button came up, and it was treating it like you were using the phone, and somebody would get a busy signal. That's what they mean by off the, off the hook. People would leave their phone sitting off to the side to avoid other people. So what's going to be too cold to stay here tonight? Let me call Sydney. She just had that new furnace put in. Maybe we can spend the night there. Aunt Sydney was kind of mean, but her house was always warm, so we kept our fingers crossed that she was home. Everyone, even Byron, cheered when Dad got Aunt Sydney, and she told us to hurry over before we froze to death. Dad went out to try and get the brown bomber started. That was what we called our car. It was a 1948 Plymouth that was dull brown and real big. Byron that it was turd brown. Uncle Bud gave it to Dad when it was 13 years old, and we'd had it for two years. Me and Dad took real good care of it, but some of the time it didn't like to start up in the winter. After five minutes, Dad came back in huffing and puffing and slapping his arms across his chest. Well, it was touch and go for a while, but the great brown one pulled through again. Everyone cheered, but me and Byron quit cheering and started frowning right away. By the way, Dad smiled at us. We knew what was coming next. Dad pulled two ice scrapers out of his pocket and said, Okay, boys, let's get out there and knock those windows out. We moaned and groaned and put some more coats on and went outside to scrape the car's windows. I could tell by the way he was pouting that Byron was going to try and get out of doing his share of the work. I'm not going to do your part, Byron. You better do it, and I'm not playing either. Shut up, punk. I went over to the brown bomber's passenger side and started hacking away at the scab of ice that was all over the windows. I finished Mama's window and took a break. Scraping ice off of windows when it's that cold can kill you. I didn't hear any sound coming from the other side of the car, so I yelled out, I'm serious, Byron. I'm not doing that side, too, and I'm only going to do half the windshield. I don't care what you do to me. The windshield on the bomber wasn't like the new 1963 cars. It had a big bar running down the middle of it, dividing it in half. Shut your stupid mouth. I got something more important to do right now. I peeked around the back of the car to see what Bai was up to. The only thing he'd scraped off was the outside mirror, and he was bending down to look at himself in it. He saw me and said, You know what, Square? I must be adopted. There just ain't no way two folks as ugly as your mama and daddy could have given birth to someone as sharp as me. He was running his hands over his head like he was brushing his hair. I said, Forget you. I went back to the other side of the car to finish the back window. I had half the ice off when I had to stop again and catch my breath. I heard, uh, heard Byron mumble my name. And that is uh, where we're going to stop right there today, guys. We're about out of time. So I hope you liked uh, meeting the new characters that we're going to be um, hearing the story about. And uh, remember to complete your exit ticket. Have a great day. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.